Welcome everyone, I am Andrew Duckworth and I'd like to thank you for joining us for our podcast for the month of March. We hope all of you are keeping safe and well, as we all hope that brighter times are on the horizon in the months ahead. We also hope that you've enjoyed our podcast so far this year. We kicked off in January with a great discussion with Mike Whitehouse from Bristol to discuss their systematic review on the effect of antibiotic loaded bone cement on the risk of revision following hip and knee replacement. And last month we chatted with Xavier Griffin about his latest trial from the White Group that compared the export dynamic plate and screw and the sliding hip screw for fixation of trochanteric hip, hip fractures. As always, we hope you're enjoying the content from the Knowledge Translation team here at the BJJ and that we're achieving our aim to improve the accessibility and visibility of the studies we publish here at the journal. As part of this, over the upcoming year, we'll be producing some special edition podcasts with our guests being the incredibly hardworking and invaluable specialty editors here at the journal. The aim of these will be to give our listeners an insight into the vital work they do here at the journal, what they feel the current research trends are in their area, as well as highlighting some papers from the past year that we've published. So today, to kick us off, I have the great pleasure of being joined by our, our very good and very busy specialty editor for NEE, Mr. Sam Usadek. Welcome, Sam, and thank you for joining us today. Thanks very much, and thanks for having me. Sam, if we sort of kick off, you know, 2020 year was a, a difficult year for all of us. And I was just thought if you could give some brief insights, maybe also with your clinical practice, but also mainly in your role as a specialty editor for me for here at the BJJ. Yeah, okay. So um, I've been specialty editor, I think, for about five years. I lose track now. I think it's about since 2016. Um, and over that time, we uh, processed yearly, usually between about two, three, sometimes up to 400 papers a year. Uh, this is specifically for needs. Uh, what we noted, of course, with the, the COVID shutdown uh, last year was that all of a sudden lots of clinicians who had been very busy had some more time to write. And so last year we pretty much doubled our uh, input of papers and I think we processed 600 in the last year, uh, which is a reasonable number, uh, particularly when the size of the paper journal doesn't grow. It means, unfortunately, that the chances of being published in the BJJ drop a little over that period although uh, the, the gems are still making it through way. Yeah, absolutely. No, absolutely. I think and that's an incredible number. And I think, as we all know, in terms of the number of submissions we have, that's a very large proportion and uh, how very busy you are. And I think we've all seen that at the journal and all the journals, isn't it? The number of papers coming in has gone up and then trying to find the, the quality ones makes it just a little bit, a little bit harder, doesn't it? Yes, yeah, so there's a little bit more noise in the system. And so uh, recognizing the signal is always a, a difficult thing. I think just finding time to read them all is, is reasonably tricky for me. We do read them all and hopefully the best ones get through. It's an interesting process actually. So specialty editor really involves curating and, and managing that whole review system, ending in a place where we've got a recommendation to give to the editor in chief. So what happens as a paper comes in, it'll be put in my in tray and I will pick reviewers. One of the things that you learn over the years from doing this is trying to pick the right reviewer for the right paper. And so knowing the review as well as I, I do, and you've got probably eight or 900 knee reviewers to select from, and knowing the ones who are going to give me the most insightful reviews on each paper, having the knowledge, having the expertise to really uh, pick it apart. Uh, and part of that, of course, is giving good feedback to the authors so that even if they don't make it through, then they've got uh, enough information there to improve the quality of their uh, paper once it does get into a journal. No, absolutely. And I think the quality of the peer review process at the journal is absolutely exceptional. I think it, and it's managed to maintain that despite how busy it's been. And with regards to COVID, I mean, I don't want us to talk about COVID too much, but how do you feel that has impacted the research in, in your area in terms of the papers that have come through in relation to that? And what do you think we've learned and what, what do we still need to know moving forward? Yeah, so there, there are the general um, points that come with COVID, which are all about managing uh, our elective patients safely. Uh, and we've had quite a bit come through the journal and also through the uh, bone and joint open as to how those processes uh, need to be managed in order to do it safely. I, I think it probably is going to shift focus a little bit, certainly in the UK uh, and I would have thought worldwide as well. There's going to be a lot of work to get through over the mm. next couple of years. Mm. Uh, we've characterised that in a, in a recent publication in BJO. Uh, and so getting through that hump of work, that backlog is going to involve different working practices and I think that stimulates uh, innovation uh, and it will probably be an important area for research. So simple things like reducing length of stay, uh, yeah. um, using procedures or, or methods to uh, reduce contact with patients. As we know, one of the risk factors for catching COVID has been length of stay, the number of uh, patient contacts with the health service or with the outside world in general. And so that the more we can minimise that going forwards, uh, I think the safer the uh, service we provide will be. So there'll be different aspects of practice that will probably be emphasised over the next 
couple of years. But o overall, I'm not sure it will change uh, the substance of what we do, maybe just the way in which we're delivering it. Yeah, I agree, Sam. And I think, it, like you say, out of a lot of these so bad times comes good innovation and hopefully good innovation and for our patients as well. I think you're right. Moving sort of away from COVID over the past year or so, what do you feel have been the main themes out with COVID for research in your area? What, is, what are the sort of common themes coming through the important questions that are being asked, do you think? So knee surgery in the journal has been quite arthroplasty centric. Uh, it, it's something I would like to change, actually. I'd quite like there to be more soft tissue, more joint preservation. I think one of the difficulties we have is standardizing methods in those practices in, in such a way as to make the uh, resultant research rigorous enough to publish it. Mm. So we do get submissions on everything through from meniscal work to ACL to osteotomies. Um, but the, the work that's done in a methodical, rigorous way tends to be arthroplasty based. And I, I think that fits with clinical practice. Yeah. Arthroplasty tends to be a procedure which follows a pattern. Uh, and so we can control most of what's done and perhaps vary just a very little bit and look for those effects, which after all is what we're trying to do with any scientific endeavor, mm. try to isolate the variable of interest. And I think that's easier to do with arthroplasty work, which is why I think the, the, the journal's output reflects that. Mm. So what's happened in the world of arthroplasty? Well, BJJ, I think, has published uh, an awful lot on uh, partial joint replacement. Again, that's not necessarily through choice. It's just that those, those papers, uh, that work is done in a, in a really good way. Um, and so it's difficult to, to not end up with those, uh, those investigations being published. Uh, I think the interest in partial joint replacement will continue to provide uh, you know, a procedure which has lower comorbidity, mm -hmm. sorry, lower morbidity associated with it than a total joint replacement in a safe way, particularly as we focus again on reducing length of stay and, and those other elements that we talked about with regards to COVID. Yeah. I think that will remain pertinent and that's why I've chosen a couple of the papers we're going to discuss later on. Yeah, um, yeah so uh, I think in the arthroplasty world, the other big innovations really are in the world of robotics. Uh, so robotic assisted surgery is probably the hot topic at the moment. Um, and so not just the effect of using a robot, but what it allows us to investigate. Again, we can really control variables in, in, a, in a way that's much more rigorous than in previous times. Yeah. So that we can look at perhaps putting a prosthesis in, in just a couple of degrees of variation in what the effect on outcome is for our patients. And that's going to allow us to really drill down uh, and, 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 and analyze and, and investigate these, uh, these very subtle differences, which may have profound effects. Yeah, absolutely, Sam. You talk about the the methodological rigor, and I think, like as we've all seen, the the quality of that has really gone up over the past couple of years. What's your take in terms of the volume of registry type papers you're getting? You know, from all the various registries, has that changed over the past couple of years? Has the quality changed? So we certainly get a, a, a fair few registry papers. So the difficulty with some of those is the uh, registry that they come from. So there are certain you know, national registries, which we, we all know about, and the number of cases inputted uh, and the penetration of those registries is very good. So you look at something like the New Zealand registry, even the Australian registry, uh, the UK registry, these are mature uh, and we can uh, look at what's uh, coming out of those registries as reflecting practice accurately in those areas. I think where we perhaps have more difficulty in drawing firm conclusions is from some of the less established registries some of the ones which are emerging in the United States, for example, where you might have very low percentage in registry terms of, of cases being input. Uh, and that really does introduce an element of selection bias, not just the centres that are going in, but also the individual cases within those centres that are being entered. Uh, and so knowing a little bit more about each registry really allows us to figure out whether the analyses that come from those uh, from those data are going to make it into the journal or not. So it's not just, I guess, all registries are equal. They're certainly very unequal. No, I think that's right. And obviously, I think, uh, I think it's one of these things where the questions the registry can ask, isn't it, in terms of what they were actually designed to do in the first place. And then actually people now, because it is, it's very tempting with thousands and thousands of patients to try and get it to answer a question it, it probably can't answer or it's very difficult to answer robustly. Do you think that's fair? Absolutely. I mean, uh, we can only ever find associations with, with registry data. Mm. Uh, cause and effect, we can't really determine. Uh, I think, it, you know, what were they designed to do really for surveillance of implants rather than anything else? Uh, it, most of them don't tell you about case mix. Uh, most of them 
uh, have very little in terms of uh, prom linkage, although you know increasingly that's becoming a feature. Mm. Uh, and so over interpretation, I think, is a danger with registry data. Yeah. Um, and we have to be very careful with such enormous numbers. Everything is statistically significant. Yes. So the yeah. way in which those data are, are handled becomes very, really very important. Absolutely, absolutely. So Sam, if we move on, that leads us nicely into some of our highlight papers and that you've kindly picked for us. With the volume that you've gone through and we've published, it's, it's difficult to pick a few, but I think they've all got nice themes to them. So if we kick off, the, the first paper is from the Revision Knee Replacement Priority Setting Partnership uh, Steering Group, and that was on behalf of BASC. And they use the James Lind Alliance Protocol to identify research priorities related to the assessment, management and rehabilitation of patients with persistent symptoms after a knee replacement. And as many of the listeners will, will know, the James Lind Alliance is a not-for-profit initiative that aims to sort of guide collaboration between patients, carers uh, and healthcare professionals into a priority setting partnership that then highlights uncertainties related to a given healthcare issue and then trying to establish a top 10 research priority in that field. I think it was a really interesting paper this because I think it's important that I mean, obviously this is becoming really the standard of how the main research priorities are being set across our specialty, isn't it really now? So I, I think this is a fantastic way uh, to, to you know, look for questions to answer. Uh, and if we think about traditional research, usually it's uh, you know a, a small number of people's enthusiasm that guides what they end up investigating. And this really flips that paradigm around and, and asks not just you know clinicians, yes, but also patients, yeah. what's important to you. Uh, yeah. And what I, I think is really interesting is what comes out is, is that actually it's not the same answers necessarily as you would get from surgeons, certainly. Mm -hmm. uh, but actually, some of them have very similar themes. But if you ask a patient what's important for you, which questions you need answered, then it, it tends to be symptom based. And actually, yeah. uh, it's, you know, if you ask a surgeon the same question, it might be which prosthesis do I end up using? Uh, yeah. so, so these symptom uh, related questions, I think, are, are very difficult to answer, probably, but mm -hmm. really, really important to ask. Yeah, uh, and so it's only right. I, I think that this type of work then guides where public funds are put in, in when it comes to funding research. Yeah, um, and I think it would be uh, more and more important for us to uh, ask our, the public, our patients, what's important to them before we uh, launch down uh, routes of investigation. Yeah, no, absolutely. And as many of us know, I think the the initiations like this, particularly the James and Alliance, they carry a huge amount of weight when you go into particularly the public funders in terms of funding these big studies and trials. Before we move on to the next page, so the top 10 priorities that came out, is that what you were expecting in terms of, were they generally the areas that you were anticipating or not? Yeah, I, I think so. I think they, it's, it's a good coverage. Um, yeah. You know, what, what brings our patients to us is usually pain and functional limitation. And strangely enough, those are high on their priority list as to what they want fixed. Uh, and so to that extent, it's reasonably predictable. I, I think some of the diagnostic questions are also really important. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, uh, making sure that we've got a, an answer to what the problem is before we try to fix it. Yeah. I think in general terms, that's very important. But clearly the, the patients in this group were, were very well informed and, and made great choices when it came to prioritising. No, absolutely. No, no, I'd encourage all our listeners and readers to go to that. I think it's a, a great, a great paper. So if we move on from that, it sort of nicely leads into um, the, the next paper, which is the PAT randomized control trial, which is based in Warwick. And that's a pragmatic single center, double blind randomized clinical trial comparing total knee replacement versus patellofemoral replacement in patients with severe arthritis of the patellofemoral joint. I'm always a bit resistant to speak to a knee surgeon about anything to do with the patella <laughs> femoral joint at the moment to have to say you, get, you guys get very excited about it and just to highlight to our listeners we'll be having a highlight paper in april about the topic and about resurfacing with a few uh, debate potentially as well i suspect which will get right, right he, he today i hope anyway but um it's an interesting trial it's good always good to see a randomized clinical trial in any area isn't it really and the, this is a good quality one so uh, an RCT, not just in orthopedics, but in arthroplasty. I mean, it's extraordinary. <laughs> yes. I mean, say, that, that, the, the whole group deserve a, a massive pat, pun intended, on the back. Right? <laughs> so, uh, no, re really, really impressive. Uh, and, you know, just to just to emphasise the importance of randomization, it, it's really so that we try to minimise the effect of unknown confounders. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we can match patients for the things that we know about. It's the things that we don't know about that can often yeah. change the results in unpredictable ways. So that's why randomization is so important. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, again, it comes to isolating the variables as we, we touched on earlier. Mm. Um, I really like this. Uh, I think it's, it's a fantastic study. 
Uh, I, I love the way it's pragmatic. I love the way they describe a, a surgeon, you know, uh, deviating from the protocol because he fancied it when he opened the knee. Uh, I, I think that's that sort of uh, sounds fairly familiar to me. And, and I think great that they put it in the discussion. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, no, I think hats off to them. It, it's, it's a great paper. Absolutely. In arthroplasty in the trials, I mean, obviously they've used the WOMAC score, didn't they? 12 months as their primary measure. And they, they comment in their discussion that the main limitation of the trial probably was the sample size because their estimate of treatment effects was slightly different than they anticipated. And I think it's a problem, isn't it, in terms of what is that primary outcome measure in arthroplasty is the best one. We don't, we don't really know that, do we yet? Or do we? <laughs> no, we definitely don't. No. Um, and it, it comes a little bit down to the different reasons people undertake arthroplasty. So if, if we come back to pain and functional limitation, uh, pain is, is subjective. Mm -hmm. You know, there is some surrogates for objective mark that you can use, but actually pain is fundamentally subjective. Mm. Uh, function it differs from person to person. And so, you know, one person's view of success might be getting to the shops and back and others might be running half, a half marathon. Mm. And so that, that's where our outcome measures really fall down. Uh, mm. And, you know, they all have described uh, um, sh shortcomings and finding something that's going to really address everything in one is impossible quite frankly so you know they mentioned the kujala which is of course a more of a sports knee score and doesn't really apply to a, a patellofemoral arthroplasty or total knee replacement group uh, and you're right there, there are definite limitations there and actually there, there are two different ways of looking at the findings you know one you could say they've shown equivalence of, of the two treatments and you could say therefore why would you perform a patellofemoral joint replacement and total knee replacement performs as well the flip side is, of course, we know the reduced morbidity associated with partial joint replacement. And so you could say, why expose somebody to the risks of a total knee for patellofemoral joint replacement? Yeah. So I, I think it's great because it stimulates debate. It's I, got, you know, a little bit of answers in there, but it's much more about the, the, the general discussion. No, I totally agree. And like you say, it's great to see such a good high quality trial in, in arthroplasty. So if we, if we move on Sam, to the third paper, uh, and this is from the Lundbeck, Lund, Lundbeck sorry, foundation center for fast trap hip and re replacement. And they're a collaborative group in Denmark, uh, and they report on just under 4,000 surgery in this prospective multi-center study that aimed to describe the trends in length of length of stay, early complications and re emissions following a union knee replacement. Uh, and it was performed at sort of eight different volume centers in Denmark using sort of a fast pack, fast track protocol. And I think in terms of getting people through the system quickly, it's quite an, an apt study really for that. And it's a really nice, nicely put together cohort study. So, uh, and those are the reasons that I thought we'd highlight it because yeah. uh, it, it's, it's the direction of travel for, for arthroplasty surgery in general it is shorter and shorter length of stay. Mm. Uh, and you know, when you, you look across the Atlantic in North America, where I don't know if it's a majority, but certainly a large minority of joint replacements are now carried out as day cases. Mm. You, 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 you start to ask the questions as to why that isn't more the case uh, on this side of the Atlantic. Mm. Uh, and so uh, th this is this is interesting. It, it's, uh, you know, of the moment. Um, recovery from COVID, as we've talked about, means reduction in length of stay. So far as I can tell, it's the only way we can start to balance the equation. We know again that COVID risk is reduced, length of stay less than three days. Mm. I, think, I think we're co authors on that paper, actually. Yes, we are. <laughs> yeah. um, and, you know, also uh, unicompartmental knee replacement, another hot topic, uh, as we discussed earlier. So I think this brings all of that together and, and shows us that, you know, a, a common theme is that the more you do of something, the better you tend to get at it. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that we can probably pick out from this paper. In the centres that do lots of uni knee replacements, they tend to have shorter length of stay. Mm. Uh, in the centres that sort of dabble in it occasionally, then they're probably managed much more like total joint arthroplasty populations and length of stay is expected to be a little bit longer. Absolutely. So there, there are, again, some clues as to how we can move forwards in, in reducing length of stay and therefore reducing morbidity for our patients uh, and improve their outcomes. Definitely. And, do you, and, and from reading that paper, do you think some of those can be taken to all aspects really of, of elective surgery really? Yeah, so I think what we're going to see over the next, uh, you know, 12, 18 months, maybe a little bit longer, is that as we start to push the uh, day surgery paradigm for, for arthroplasty, um, all of length of stay starts to reduce because we start to put in place structures which allow us to get patients through the system a little bit faster. Yeah. And perhaps also patient expectations and clinician expectations will change so that length of stay becomes as short as it can safely be. Yeah. Uh, and of course, there's always a flip side of that, which is the complications, the readmissions, which they looked at in this study as well. Yeah. Um, and so we have to make sure this is done in the safest possible manner. But I, I think it's definitely the direction of travel. 
definitely, definitely. So if we move on, Sam, to our final paper, which we're just going to touch on, which is from Sweden. And I was really pleased you picked this. I thought it was a really interesting study because obviously the first thing to say, it's a qualitative study, which is something we see so little of in, in our specialty. And, you know, it, it is becoming more, more popular, shall we say, and certainly people have, be, have been embedding studies like this within trials and other, and other studies. And it involves 18 joint replacement surgeons and they investigated the experience and emotional impact of joint infection, prosthetic joint infection on these surgeons and aim to identify holistic strategies to improve the management uh, of PGI and protect the surgeon's well-being. And I, I think it's important to highlight the first time you read the title, you think, oh, but what about the patients? But they're very clear about that, you know, that the patients they acknowledge go through a huge amount. But I think it's it was really eye-opening, actually, I think, to read this and just reading the insights. And actually, you know, not just in joint replacement infection, the feelings we all have when we have a complication and how we feel about it, really, and how we deal with it. So patients want their clinicians to care. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, anyone I know uh, who, who works with, with patients it cares about their outcomes. Mm. And, and some of that's obviously taken on a personal level, which is, I think, what we're really digging down into with this paper. And, and as you say, I, I think this is really interesting. It's not something that we, we see a lot about and, and another a good reason to highlight it. And, you know, the other side of that is, of course, that infection, of course, it's appalling for, for the patient who's experiencing it. But it has effects on the surgical team uh, and those effects can be as highlighted here guilt uh, they, they can be almost a grief response yeah. and what you really don't want is for the surgeon to get in the way of the patient's recovery and i, I think that's the message here actually yeah. that it's not just about managing the uh, the surgical team's emotional state and, and providing support although those things you know particularly at the moment, we're, we're, we're highlighting the importance of being a little bit more nurturing towards, you, towards each other at work. Those things are clearly very important in and of themselves. But here, in addition to that, is, is the impact on the patient's outcome and really emphasising the importance of spreading the load a little bit throughout an MDT uh, in order to allow uh, the right management to be undertaken at the right time for the patient to, to come through as unscathed as possible. So uh, I, I think it's, it's really almost a 360 view of, of the patient's experience, uh, yeah. but this time focusing a little bit more on, on the team who are looking after the patient uh, and seeing how uh, they can be supported to, to get through it. Yeah, no, really great paper. I agree, you know, and I think it's with a lot of these qualitative studies. Obviously, there's there's quotes from the people who've contributed to it, and I think it's quite nice because often a lot of the quotes that are in there. You've, you know, we've all said ourselves or felt ourselves. It's really difficult diff dealing with PGI if we don't have a group of colleagues to talk to, and I think you know we all feel that when we're going through those difficult times and have you know complex patients um, that we're trying to get through difficult times, our colleagues are really important. But no, I agree, and it's nice to see a good quality quality study. Uh, in our area. That's great, Sam. So just to finish off, Sam, before, before we go in terms of, you know, we've, we've touched on it already, but you know, what do you think moving forward are going to be the main topics in your area? What do you expect over the next year? Maybe two is going to be the main themes coming through. So I think we're going to see a little bit of uh, more of the same in terms of uh, the impact in arthroplasty of surgical decision-making. Mm. Uh, I think we're going to see hopefully some advances in infection, both diagnosis and treatment, uh, which is one of, uh, if not the leading cause of, of failure of arthroplasty throughout the world. Uh, and yeah, you know, how we deliver healthcare to a larger population that's getting a little bit sicker. Deconditioning is going to be a big theme, I think, throughout. One of the things that we've certainly picked up in my clinical practice is that patients are have been prevented from, from presenting to primary care at an early stage and are presenting therefore to us in clinic in a much worse state than they would have been 18 months ago. So deconditioning is going to be a big thing and how we work as a team to, to help get our patients in a fit state to, to have the procedures or the interventions that are going to allow them to get their function back on track. So I, I think there's a whole bunch, it's, it's an exciting time as you said, you know, at the beginning often adversity breeds uh, innovation and I think that's where we are at the moment uh, and you know we will have some more robots that, that will definitely be there as well <laughs> yeah no I, I agree Sam well I think that's all we have time for but thank you so much for joining us that was a really excellent overview of your specialty area and on behalf of the general thank you for all the hard work that you do in your area I know how busy you are looking after the the knee area so uh, it, that was a really interesting and informative chat and uh, thanks so much for joining us a great pleasure thank you and to our listeners, we do hope you've enjoyed joining us. Feel free to tweet or post about anything we've discussed here today. Take care, everyone, and we'll see you soon.